And now we move uh, to the next talk. Uh, hello? Marcel. Hello? Yeah, hello. I'm Marcel. I'm here. So, uh, so I, have to share I will try screen. to introduce you very fast before you start. So Marcel Conste is a physicist, actually graduated from Karlsruhe University, and then he did his rehabilitation in the artificial intelligence in Bochum University. And then after that, he joined Slack, Stanford University, to investigate and further develop RE uh, paradigms for the particle physics experiment, where actually I get to know him from the particle physics. And uh, Marcel joined uh, Karlsruhe as a department head and leader to work on the establishment of the LHC computing grid in Germany. And after that, the D-Grid initiative. And uh, then he uh, took over the cloud computing research group at KIT. And since, the, uh, since the 2015, he uh, gets back to the research at the Heidelberg University. And now he's working there as a senior scientist and uh, for supporting experiment in one of the most challenging uh, issues by the particle experiment, the track reconstruction. And today he will speak to us about the graph networks for track reconstruction. Marcel, yeah. please go ahead. Thank you, Mohamed. Do, do you see the screen? Is it okay? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So thank you for having me here in this interesting conference. And I'm going to report on a work that we have uh, issued uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, so graph networks for track reconstruction. So if you think of uh, pattern recognition, especially in the tracking sector, tracking is a very prominent uh, uh, issue. So you see some examples from the gaming, for instance, if you look at uh, Go or uh, soccer, uh, but also uh, tracking is important in security uh, concerns. You see here tracking people uh, and also very prominent is tracking in the aircraft um, sector. So tracking aircrafts. Here you see an example of three aircrafts. So you have uh, here uh, measured uh, points by radar, and uh, the, the task is to then uh, connect these points and uh, determine the flight direction. Um, this is a very easy example, as you only have uh, three tracks to reconstruct. If you think of more um, um, elaborated um, issues, so we have, for instance, the LHC at CERN uh, here, the experiments, and for sure also uh, at, at GSI, the FAIR environment. So we have quite a huge amount of uh, tracks generated by um, charged particles uh, coming from uh, the vertex in the interaction and then uh, going outside, leaving uh, measured points in the tracking devices. Here in this example, uh, this is an example from high luminosity LHC, the next uh, round of uh, experiments that will take place at CERN. And this is a very demanding environment. So first of all, we have about 100,000 uh, tracks to reconstruct. Think of the airplane example, it was only, only three tracks. And here we have 100,000, uh, uh, 10,000 tracks and 100,000 points. And um, here's an example, a simulation of that new environment where we are simulating um, all silicon uh, tracker and the responses in this all silicon tracker. If the, ch if the charged particles traverse this tracker, they leave uh, measured points in 3D. So it is very demanding. And the question is, how can we tackle this problem to reconstruct these 10,000 uh, tracks in this environment? So the problem definition is as follows. So you have this uh, all silicon um, uh, tracking devices as shown here, then you have uh, the dots in three dimensions and the task is then to reconstruct uh, from the dots uh, these uh, tracks in uh, three dimensions, which is uh, very uh, demanding. The current algorithms, uh, if you think, if you are an expert, you know this, um, you have, uh, for instance, Kalman filters and you have essentially a combinatorial approach. So you start from the innermost uh, uh, vertex and then you go outside and you then try to uh, apply a model, which is usually a helix model, and then uh, picking up these points and try to reconstruct the track. You remove these points from the set and you start over and over again until you have all 
possible solutions. So, and given the points and the tracks, you can then estimate the track parameters and uh, do the physics at the end. The challenge is um, uh, in the new uh, LHC high luminosity area uh, that the current algorithms really do not uh, perform very well. They take too much CPU. And therefore, there was the idea to explore faster and maybe more accurate approaches and uh, potentially um, AI based approaches. So what can we do? Uh, if you think of convolutional neural networks, there would be an image based approach where you just present uh, uh, input um, uh, pattern of uh, the dots. And then you would train a convolutional network to uh, to um, uh, learn stuff by using stuff filters, the patterns, and uh, then you would uh, then have segment features out of the patterns, and then you would have higher level features at the end where you would reconstruct the track, similar as you would do in the classical uh, picture reconstruction where you would uh, have input pictures and you would then uh, learn different um, uh, features like dogs, cats, and the like. So it turns out that uh, this uh, a priori uh, approach where you have a, a full uh, data set in the beginning, it doesn't work very well. Uh, up to now, to my knowledge, nobody in the world has come up with a satisfying solution uh, where you could uh, convolute, um, say, uh, 10,000 tracks. Uh, it works for single individual tracks, but it doesn't work for uh, tracks at large. Then you could uh, use maybe recurrent neural networks where you have LSTM based approach. Uh, here the idea is to have a more or less local approach where you try to uh, connect the dots in different layers and then um, uh, have a local uh, approach to the problem uh, and you would come up with different solutions. If you have the input here and, and the output, you would then come up with uh, the model prediction, which is a, a straight track in this case. Um, also, these point-based approaches are not uh, working satisfactory. In the case of high luminosity LHC, the problem is that we have a very, very high density of dots. So here we have the problem uh, that these um, local approaches, they would just uh, uh, be confused by neighboring uh, dots and you would not come up with um, single identified uh, tracks. So uh, from, from this, um, uh, we started to think of uh, a different approach, uh, which was based on the idea of using directed acyclic graphs uh, or DAGs. A directed acyclic graph, is, which is shown here, uh, is a graph that does propagate information uh, from the input to the output or from one side to the other side without having uh, redirected loops. Say the information flow is uh, from one side to the other. And this is shown also here, here you have a, a DAG. So the information flow is from here to there and it's a directed flow. Uh, it's also possible that the flow goes between neighbors but never goes uh, backwards. So um, this, uh, a, a approach can be used to then um, form neural networks. Uh, it's similar to having feed forward networks, but you would replace the layers which are shown here by graphs. And then you have the same uh, philosophy. You have the features here. You present the features to the graph network. The graph uh, is also able to grow. This is also very interesting. So you can start with a small graph and then add nodes to the graph as you learn. And then you have a, a set of hidden uh, nodes and you have then state nodes and outputs. And from the state nodes, you can then uh, sum up the sum of states and uh, get the information whether the features are uh, recognized uh, well. And then on the output, it goes like uh, everywhere in the world. If you use the uh, supervised uh, model, uh, you would then do the training. And at the end, uh, you would then uh, come up uh, with um, features that you could uh, then uh, identify in, say, an, ex an physical uh, particle physics experiment. 
So uh, convolution in that case, if you have, uh, if you want to do convolution, could also be done. Uh, so here's a, a uh, standard uh, view of convolution. You have a node, you have neighboring nodes, and then you would uh, uh, then convolute uh, these uh, patterns to the set of nodes. You move uh, this uh, along here. Uh, on the graph network, the same can be done, but uh, rather than having uh, these straight connections or well-defined connections, you had, would have dynamic, flexible uh, connections in the graph, and you can also do graph convolution, if you would like. The application domains of these graph networks are uh, very uh, wide, very broad. So in computer science, for instance, you can uh, use these graphs or the graph networks for all kind of routing, routing algorithms, uh, as shown here, or tracking algorithms. But you, in, uh, for sure, you can also use them in chemistry, for instance, for molecular engineering, if you are looking for uh, um, optimization of uh, uh, molecules or understanding of molecules, learning of molecules, then you could uh, simply um, model um, a molecule by a graph uh, and uh, use this as a basis to do uh, supervised uh, training. So uh, having said this, um, the context of this work, which is very interesting. So we had an international competition, which was launched on the Kaggle platform on the CoderLab platform uh, in 2018 uh, by uh, participating uh, institutes at CERN and CERN. Uh, so uh, the idea was to uh, come up with new uh, models to solve the track reconstruction problem. Uh, but do not do this only in the physics domain, but pose this problem on a platform uh, for the public domain and also include uh, over the world um, experts in informatics, uh, computer science and uh, artificial intelligence to come up with maybe um, interesting uh, solutions to the problem. Um, the idea was to bring up a set of simulated events, as I showed uh, event uh, beforehand. Uh, it was a set of thousand events that was uh, posted uh, on the platform. And then uh, everybody was invited to come up with solutions uh, to solve the tracking problem. Uh, there were two rounds for this um, endeavors. The first round was um, called uh, Track ML. Um, contest. So the idea was on Kaggle to uh, accept um, uh, solutions which were presented as input files to the platform and then they were uh, 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 ranked and we had a, a leaderboard uh, where the best solutions were presented. And after this was finished, there was um, a throughput contest and this was where I uh, and, uh, was participating on the Coda lab where we did not uh, pose um, uh, files as input uh, but uh, there were the, the events and we had to come up with code that was executed on the platform and uh, it was the task to not only have a code that is very precise in the reconstruction but also is very fast. So there was uh, uh, two parameters to optimize precision and speed. And uh, uh, so here is uh, the solution that we came up. So uh, to give you an, a hint uh, to reconstruct such an event of 100,000 uh, dots and 10,000 tracks with the uh, uh, normal algorithms, I would say, this would take about 10 minutes on a, per event on a um, uh, fast CPU. So uh, the solution that we came up uh, with uh, artificial intelligent uh, uh, parts, it's a hybrid model, as I will uh, explain in a moment. Uh, it took about seven seconds per event and it also had the accuracy of 93%. That means out of the, of the 10,000 tracks, there were about 9,300 uh, assigned cor correctly. So the idea was uh, that uh, we would take these dots, these hits, and we would sort these uh, hits in voxels. A voxel is a space element. 
which is shown here. So the whole problem domain is um, uh, made up of uh, small space elements. And then uh, these um, would be uh, organized in direct acyclic graphs. So you would have um, a, a training going on. Uh, you would take, uh, say, a, a few hundred or a, a few dozen um, events. You would then train uh, direct acyclic graphs for these uh, events. And this would maybe be useful to, to be taken as a kind of a track library that would be good to um, take care of a first uh, assortment of dots uh, to track um, candidates. So these decks are used to fast navigate through the voxel space. Yeah, so you, I will come to that point. So we had two sections uh, in the detector, which was a disk section uh, at the both ends of the detector, and we had a radial section in the inner uh, uh, part of the detector. So we had two sets of DAGs for the disk section and radial section. And then we also were uh, training uh, doublets uh, with respect to the vertex. Uh, with uh, neural networks. So this is shown here, neural network one and neural network two for the two different uh, parts of the detector. Then we would uh, have a doublet finder. So you, if you co combine two hits, uh, two track segments, uh, you can then have the neural network uh, as an estimator for the quality of the solution. You would make uh, all possible combinations in the deck and then you would uh, take the output of the neural network um, to de de determine uh, the quality of, of a possible solution. And at the end, if you have all these uh, doublets, which are uh, several millions uh, of possible um, uh, segments that you would could combine to tracks, then you would uh, start from the doublets to uh, form triplets, which is a overarching uh, third neural network, which is shown here. And if you have the triplets as a set of triplets, which are typically 200,000 uh, triplets for this uh, problem, uh, then you would start with a more or less classical approach. You can then assign these um, uh, triplets uh, to tracks using a helix model and then extend uh, the tracks uh, on both sides. And at the end, uh, you would uh, then also uh, remove um, double solutions and come up with a list of uh, the single uh, uh, associated um, uh, hits, hits to tracks. So uh, this worked very well. Uh, so, uh, and I show here the, the graph network training. So if you uh, look at the problem that we have with uh, uh, in the problem domain, you have uh, 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 the DAGs that are uh, living in um, uh, helix coordinates. And uh, in the, you see here the voxels that are making up the track candidates. We have a multi-scale resolution. So we have multiple networks uh, for the doublet finding and uh, for the triplet finding, depending on the uh, section of the detector. The training is typically done with 15 to 25 events. And if you look at the pass finding, the possible pass is just made up of these voxels in the um, deck. So uh, the intuition for this pattern recognition with machine learning is that we have a model free estimator. We start basically with basic quantities. We, have, we are use, using just coordinates and simple derived values uh, like angles and, and, so on, and, and the like. We only use very basic detector specific information. There is not a detector model explicitly in the first uh, part of the algorithm. So we are using polar coordinates in the feature space, uh, some directional cosines and simple helix calculations, which give a score. But in principle, this would not be needed, but it speeds the things up. So a training is being done with uh, Monte Carlo simulated events. Here we have um, a definition of uh, uh, a set of angles. You see here uh, two layers of the detector system. 
and here you span a, a section that's called D from one part to the other, and then you are looking using the uh, energy uh, patterns here. Uh, you are then determining um, two possible directions shown here and there, and then you would uh, determine the angle and use these two angles uh, of the two solutions uh, in the network training as well. This uh, turned out to be very helpful in the training. A very interesting um, observation that we made, I call this feature folding. Uh, the tracking problem is symmetric with respect to polar coordinates. So in the C direction, uh, you can mirror the, the event and you have also a um, circular um, uh, sy symmetry around the detector. And then you can try to fold the feature space, uh, say we're taking the absolute value of C for instance, or you can also do the similar thing with phi and theta angles. And uh, it turns out that this yields better results if you fold the detector uh, with respect to the symmetry axis. And uh, by just using simple uh, arithmetics, like taking the absolute value and uh, subtracting pi half, for instance, here, uh, for um, a feature called phi two, or the thing absolute value of C instead of C. Uh, so the idea is uh, that you uh, have uh, uh, complete symmetry in the event and you would then uh, only take part of the detector and uh, do all the reconstruction there. It turns out that this is very helpful uh, both for the training and for the um, uh, recall at the end. Uh, so in principle, um, this can be uh, also done in other environments where you have a comp uh, nice symmetry. The training uh, was done with multiple layer perceptrons very easily. This was done due to the fact and optimized to a small set of networks as we had the constraint that the algorithm had to go very fast, not only precise, but also fast. And it turned out that using small networks and building a hybrid solution with the uh, DAX was um, was uh, very um, uh, useful with respect to speed. And it turns out the training goes very nice. So sum summarizing uh, the machine learning advantages, um, the solution to my uh, opinion can be very nicely transferred to different uh, context as we are more or less using a model free estimator based on uh, simple uh, basic features and also simple arithmetics. So there's a graceful degradation in presence of changes. So if you change the geometry, you have the channels calibration. This could be that uh, uh, artificial intelligence based solution could be uh, very helpful if you have uh, a degradation uh, in the detector system. And the graphs that are based of this algorithm can be used to form arbitrary uh, paths um, also in presence of kinks and maybe um, events that are not very regular. This could be very useful uh, to simulate um, also non-symmetric problems that are not um, uh, in a uh, homogeneous magnet magnetic field. So, uh, Summarizing uh, the takeaway message is uh, we have a very uh, natural data representation for a lot of scientific problems with graph networks. And we have also a promising performance uh, in pattern recognition tasks, uh, as was shown in the tracking machine learning challenge. Uh, and uh, this work also has been already published. If you look here, uh, the throughput phase paper uh, was published this year and you can find uh, it uh, at this um, DUI. So here I am at the end of the talk and I hope that you uh, got a good impression of the usefulness of graph networks. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Marcel, for the very interesting talk and very technical. So, um, uh, yeah, it seems that we don't have a lot of people from the particle physics here, so there are not uh, too much questions, but uh, this gives me the chance to ask you now. <laughs> On uh, your slide 13, uh, you spoke about the accuracy, the efficiency of, of uh, 93% for the uh, track with uh, and, and exactly this is line. Uh, you did not mention anything about the fake rate. Do you well, have fake rate? Okay. Um, um, actually, um, this uh, the seven percent is maybe uh, the fake rate more or less because uh, the uh, est the the quality of the event has been determined by comparing the tracks to uh, the original tracks that okay. were in the Monte Carlo simulations. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, there were only tracks accepted in the, in the, uh, yeah, by, by the committee that were uh, reconstructed by 100%. That means these are actually 93 of accurately measured uh, uh, tracks and um, uh, the fake rate is, is in the 7% that, that is missing. So the, the, the whole inefficiency comes from fake tracks. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving 10,000 reconstructed tracks. If there are 10,000 tracks uh, in the beginning. Yeah. And um, they tell me, they compare it to the original set that 93% of this is accurate and 7% are wrong. Okay. Uh, we have uh, another question from. Bonga, I'm sorry if I read the name wrong. Uh, do you take into account the tracks that go backwards? If we are to find exotic particles, they might not follow a commonly thought track. Yeah, I, I should say that in this contest, there were only tracks in the moment that came from the vertex. Okay. So we did not have uh, secondaries or kinks. Uh, this was a clean sample, so to say. Yeah, and um, uh, as a matter of fact, I did not yet study what happens in the presence of kinks. Yeah, so or if you have go, tracks going backwards from secondaries, so uh, this is a point that should be studied. Tracks. Yeah, it's only uh, uh, yeah straightforward tracks from the vertex. Uh, good. Uh, there is another question from Michael Postman. Uh, how about problems with overlapping tracks in high luminosity and other problems coming up with increasing the track numbers? Yeah. Um, so uh, technically speaking, um, there were a lot of um, uh, double solutions. Yeah. And um, this uh, algorithm, I didn't mention this, uh, it, it uh, starts to define uh, outlier density yeah, so that means you look at a point, you look at a track candidate or possible solution, and you have a density distribution uh, that defines the outlierness of, of a point. And um, depending on this number that comes out of this density um, probability, there is um, a cut or it, 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 you make a decision to uh, put a, a point to one or the other solution. And this turns out to work very well. Uh, this um, technique has been invented in the first part of the Trek ML contest. It also has been published. Um, uh, it was invented by a, a young scientist from, from Sweden, Johan Wind. And uh, you can look this up in the paper as well. There's a link. Okay. It turns That's out that the outlier definition works better uh, than the track definition, interesting enough. Very fast the question, the last one, and we will move to the next. Would the, from Anastasia Nikolaova, would the craft network be suitable for tracking objects of changing shapes? Supposing that the reason for shape change is a complex physical process. Oh, <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, yes, one, one could also uh, uh, discuss this a little bit further. Uh, I think yes, because the graph 
uh, can also be organized in a way that it's, um, uh, I would say, um, it holds more than one feature. Yeah. So you can uh, have in each node, you can have uh, more than one feature. This actually uh, be used in the gaming industry. I didn't put this slide in. I have a slide from, from the gaming industry where they exactly doing this. So if you have uh, decision trees, uh, you can also move this as part of the graph. And then you can um, have a fork, say, between different um, ways of looking at the event or at this part of the event. Thank you very much, Marcel, for the interesting talk and the discussion. And uh, please, if you can be available in the breakout rooms, then we can continue the discussion. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you.